Amen. Well, we come now to our scripture reading for our sermon passage today, which is going to be from Esther chapter 3 and chapter 4. In particular, I'm going to be reading from chapter 4, verses 12 to 17. The whole story is chapters 3 and 4, and I'll be reading out those verses in chapter 4. So will you please stand for the reading of God's Word? The book of Esther, chapter 4. Verses 12 to 17, hear God's word. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king Though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we come now to uh, God's word, let's bow our heads in prayer together. Our Lord God, we thank you for uh, Esther. We thank you for this story. We thank you for your word. And we pray now as we come to your word that you would help us to receive it, uh, to understand it. Help me, Lord, to make it clear. And Lord, uh, help us all, having understood, we pray, uh, to be transformed by it and able, therefore, to communicate your word to others. And we pray these things uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, We come then to this uh, next part and this amazing story uh, in the book of Esther. Uh, We're looking at uh, that Esther chapter 3 to 4, but in particular, uh, these few verses that uh, Pastor Ben Panner just read out for us, verses 12 to 17 of of chapter 4. And uh, in this uh, section, there's a very famous phrase, one of the most famous phrases, well, certainly in the book of Esther, it's the, it's the center point, really, of the whole book. Uh, and indeed, one of the most famous phrases in the whole Bible. And so it's a wonderful thing this morning to come to this, um, for such a time as this, very famous phrase. But there's always a little bit of a risk with such familiar texts in the Bible, and that risk is misunderstanding. It's very common for some of the most familiar parts of the Bible to be misinterpreted, uh, misunderstood. Uh, For instance, uh, the well-known phrase, probably the most well-known phrase in the Bible these days, do not judge. Well, that does not mean uh, that we should never exercise any kind of critical discernment because in context, in that sermon, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is preaching, he also says, uh, do not cast your pearls before swine, which is some kind of judgment. Uh, So it doesn't mean that, but often it's used that kind of way. Jesus is talking, don't make any ultimate spiritual judgment about someone's eternal destiny. That's, That's what he's saying. Or uh, perhaps the the, uh, most well-known verse in the whole Bible, John 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever uh, should believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Very familiar. Uh, And yet quite often misused. Uh, Sometimes in Christian circles that, that phrase, for God so loved the world, is applied, therefore, we should exercise uh, justice ministries or take care of the poor, which we certainly should, but you can't get there from John chapter 3, verse 16. For that, you need 
the story of the Good Samaritan or um, uh, the teaching that we uh, should do good to all men, especially those who belong to the household of believers or, or something. But not from John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He, he didn't send a care package. He sent Jesus. And so the application of that text is, of course, evangelism. If God sent Jesus to die on the cross, you would think we should tell people about that. That's the application of that text, but often it's not used that way. God so loved the world, send a care package. No. God so loved the world, send a missionary. Tell someone about Jesus. Tell your neighbor about Jesus. Obviously, we should send care packages, but again, you get there from the Good Samaritan or some other passage in the Bible. Well, this text, for such a time as this, I can just imagine, and I, I've come across this sort of thing happening, but I can just imagine a well-meaning chaplain um, who's giving a, a final encouragement uh, to a team before a certain football game today. Uh, using this text, you know, for such a time as this, and I understand that well-meaning intention that, that uh, we have an opportunity before us, let's make the most of it. But is that really what's being said here? And so in order to help us understand it and apply it rightly, we, uh, the structure for the sermon is simply going to be, what's the problem that then Esther is being called upon to be the solution? What's the problem? What's the solution? All right, so first of all, the problem. And uh, the problem in Esther's day, we'll see how this resonates uh, with our day. The, the problem in Esther's day was very simply that Haman, uh, you can read about this in, in chapter three, the enemy of God's people, had gone to the king and he had got the king's imprimatur, his seal of legality behind genocide against the Jewish people, against God's people. This is the problem, but, but there's a little more to it than that. Actually, Haman, we're told, was uh, from the line of Agag, and Mordecai, who Haman is responding to because Mordecai had not bowed before him, and therefore uh, Haman is acting vengeance, not just on Mordecai, but on all the Jewish people. But there's a little more to that. Haman is from the line of Agag, and Mordecai, we're told, is from the same line from which King Saul came. And in the Bible, we know that King Saul had a huge battle against the Agagites and wiped many of them out. And so there's this blood feud between Haman and Mordecai. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's the problem, uh, potential genocide. What about the problem you're facing? We can get granular, um, particular, um, loneliness. Many people feel alone these days. Uh, money. There's not enough money at the end of the month. Um, work, what's my responsibility at school? Uh, children, my marriage is, in is having difficulties. We can get granular. And at a granular level, Esther's problem was that, well, she was a little bit estranged from the king. She hadn't been invited into the king's presence for 30 days. That was her granular problem. But when the text says, for such a time as this, that's not what it means. That Esther hadn't been invited into the king's presence. What it means is, the granular problem is an expression of the big problem. And when we experience anxiety today, loneliness today, these are granular particular expressions of a time that we're in. And one way of thinking about this, in, in Greek, there are, two, uh, there are two different words for time. One is chronos, which means the time on your clock, the time on the watch, you know, it's this time of day. And, and, and then kairos, which tends to mean more like season, um, the moment, the time. Obviously, this is written in Hebrew, but I'm using that as an illustration to describe the time. It's not saying what day it was, it's saying it's this time this moment. 
What's the time that we're in that the granular things that you're facing are an expression of? And we need to know that. We need to understand the problem to know what the solution should be. And very simply, I'm just going to give you two channels that you can explore more later this afternoon or this week to, to explain the time that we're all in. And one is identity, and the other is technology. I'll just do it very briefly. This is the time that we're in. And the identity thing is, and that you can explore this in, um, as a, a book written by um, a Canadian philosopher called A Secular Age. It's a long book, but basically in this, in this book, he says that our age is the age of authenticity. What he means by that is not what we normally mean by being authentic. When we say be authentic, we tend to mean uh, be real, don't pretend. No, what he means by that is when he says we live in the age of authenticity, what he means by that is we're living in an age where everyone thinks they can redefine who they are. They can make themselves whatever they want to be. They can hack their own identity. They can re-engineer their self. And he's saying that's everywhere. You see the same sort of analysis in a, in a recent book written by an evangelical uh, Christian um, called Carl Truman, who's written this book, um, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. What's going on? This, part of this identity part of the time is that in our time, and it impacts us all, the, the idea is, the, the thinking is, the feeling is, I can re-engineer who I am. And then along with that, and these two things just kind of fuel each other. There's technology. Now, I'm a tech fan, okay? I, I have social media, I have a phone, I, I think technology provides huge opportunities for the gospel today, much like the Roman roads did in Paul's day. They're channels that we can take the gospel down. God sent a life ministries, which takes the preaching of this pulpit and puts it out through radio, through media, huge opportunities. But, and this is something I've been wrestling with over the last few years, and I think I finally got it. There's a thing that's developing, has been developing the last few years. And it's particularly related to big tech. So YouTube, uh, Google, uh, Twitter, Facebook, big tech. And there's an article just this week in the New York Times uh, written by um, a professor of Harvard Emerita. So not some sort of you know, um, bigot, un uneducated, uh, biased. This is a Harvard professor Emerita writing in the New York Times. And she says, I don't, I don't know what she believes, I assume she's not a Christian, but maybe she is, I just don't know. But she says that big tech is having this impact. And as I'm saying here, these two things, identity and technology, are fueling each other. So big tech, the basic sort of foundation of big tech is that our data, the data we use in big tech, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, that kind of thing, is theirs. They own it. it. It's the contract that's made when we use it. And the reason for that is that the, then the algorithms of big tech, YouTube, are all designed to show us more of what we like, what we click on, what we prefer. If you click on something, if you watch something a, a, a little bit longer than something else, the algorithm is designed to show you more of that. And the reason why that is, is not because they want to show you what you like. The reason why that is, is because they want your data. And the longer you stay on the platform, it's all designed to get you to stay longer on that platform. The longer you stay on the platform, the more of your data they will have. And that's how they make money. They're, 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 they're harvesting millions of data points every, certainly every hour, maybe every minute. And what that means then is, and the, 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 uh, the, the head of Google admitted this a few years ago, he said, we have no way of discerning what is true. They're not, they're not, they're not 
pumping more truth at you than pumping more of what you've preferred at you. And so what that means is that increasingly you get stuck in a cycle of seeing more of what you've preferred and more of it and more of it and more of it and more of it and more of it. it. It's like you're in a cascading spiral of mirrors reflecting back to you what you have liked in the past. And so that identity, I can be whoever I am, then is fueled by the tech thing, presenting more and more of that to you. It's like you live in an echo chamber. It's, it's not an information age, it's a misinformation age. And that's a huge, see this is a huge problem. What, what that, you know, what's the problem, what's the solution? This is a huge problem, it fuels all the anxiety. It fuels all the loneliness. It fuels all the confusion. Someone like me and you, if you're leading a Bible study or teaching your children, you know, I'm trying to sow the seed of God's word right now. But there are all these thorns, massive amounts of thorns, constantly we're exposed to all this misinformation all the time. And the challenge is to get this word, this seed, to stick. And so the identity fuels the tech thing and it spiraling, cascade of mirrors, an echo chamber. It's a huge pro- it's a problem for our democracy. It's a problem for society. That's why we're so fragmented. One of the many reasons we're so fragmented. I can be whoever I want to be. I'll define my own identity. And then it's repeated to us over and over and over and over again in our own little echo chamber. It's a huge challenge for the gospel. Massive challenge for discipling our our children. What's the solution? Well, so here I think we can then begin to understand how helpful this phrase for such a time as this is, really is. The solution, I'm going to put it simply like this, is moving from S, what I'm going to call Esther A to Esther B. Okay, moving from Esther A to Esther B. And see, Esther A, and you get this right before our passage, um, basically what Esther is saying is there ain't anything I can do Um, I haven't been invited into the king's presence for a long time. I know this is a problem. It's a huge problem. I understand that. But there's nothing I can do. That's Esther A. Esther B is um, uh, verse 16. She replies to Mordecai when Mordecai challenges her. So you've got to do something. Esther B is this. Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast. And now remember, um, in the book of Esther, the, the name of God is not mentioned once. And so every time we, and the reason why it's not mentioned, remember, is so that it's a rhetorical technique of the, of the writer of Esther. So that that name of God, every time we read what's going on, we hear the name of God in our mind. And so when we read, hold a fast, we're meant to read, well, of course, and prayer. And she's asking people to pray for her, but it's meant, it's a rhetorical technique for us to see the hidden hand of God behind everything. So hold a fast, and she's asking them to pray, of course, on my behalf, don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast and pray, as you do. Then I'll go to the king, Though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. That's, that's, that's Esther B. She's going to take the risk. She's going to do her part. So there's this huge ocean of a problem. And it rolls up onto each and every single one of our doorsteps. I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling lonely. I'm feeling estranged. I don't know what's true anymore. And the solution to the problem is for such a time as this. 
moving from S to A. I can't do anything about it. To S to B. I'm going to go into the king's palace. Pray for me. And if I perish, I perish. You see, for us as a church, our, our mission is we've got it on the tower. Every time you drive past the church, you come into the church building, it's on our web page, it's everywhere. Our mission is proclaiming the gospel. And what this means for us as a church is for us to solve this problem, this great cascading spiral of mirrors, this identity, I can be whatever I want to be, this, this age of authenticity that rolls up, this ocean of misinformation that, that throttles the seed of the word. For us to solve that problem, what it means is, that proclaiming the gospel, what it means is we need an army of Esther B's proclaiming the gospel. Every parent, every teenager, every college student, every business person, every professor, every ministry leader, every publisher. We need an army of Esther B's for such a time as this. Discipling, praying for, training, writing, teaching, encouraging for such a time as this. I was thinking through how to illustrate this, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an old book, but, and I haven't read it for many years, but I, I went back just to uh, check up on it um, on the internet. You can use tech, it's fine. Um, and there's actually a, a movie made of this book on YouTube, but you can check it, that's fine. You just gotta know what's behind it so you don't get trapped in it. Um, this, this book is uh, The Hiding Place by Corrie Ten Boom. It's a great story, a real story of what really happened. If you haven't ever read it, I recommend it to you. Um, the story is of this Dutch family who faced by this huge global problem of Nazism did their thing, their part, their bit and hid some Jews from the Nazis in their own house, in a hiding place. And some of them perished for doing it. For such a time as this. Moving from S to A, S to B. For such a time as this, except That's not quite it either. Because that time is then picked up by Jesus when he says, my hour has come, my time has come. And he perishes, Esther does not, that you might flourish. And he dies that you might live. And he is crucified and raised from the dead that in him you might rise to newness of life and live as an Esther B now in this world and then for all eternity in him. For such a time as this. Let's pray together. Our Lord God, we do pray that you would uh, give us wisdom for the particular ways that we have opportunity right in front of us to make perhaps the critical contribution in, these, in this time in which we all live. Let's just have a moment for you to bring before the Lord the opportunity perhaps that you have and ask him to help you discern it and see it 
I move from S to A to S to B. Just do that in a moment of quiet before the Lord. Our gracious Lord and Master, we do thank you that you've called us to proclaim the gospel. Help us to all be active in that. We pray, Lord, that we would have body life where we're caring for each other, picking up the phone, calling each other, sending each other emails, reaching out to each other. And we pray we might be active in training our children and discipling those around us. And we ask, Lord, that as Esther experienced, even though that might seem scary, that you would use it and it would make a real difference. And ultimately, Lord, we trust you and your love and the hour, the time that you went to the cross for us that we might live. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.